Let us pray. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns for ever and ever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant will prosper. He shall be lifted up, exalted, rise to great heights. As the crowds were appalled on seeing him, so disfigured did he look, that he seemed no longer human. So will the crowds be astonished at him, and kings stand speechless before him. For they shall see something never told, and witness something never heard before. Who could believe what we have heard, and to whom has the power of the Lord been revealed? Like a sapling, he grew up in front of us, like a root in arid ground. Without beauty, without majesty, we saw him. No looks to attract our eyes, a thing despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. A man to make people screen their faces. He was despised and we took no account of him. And yet ours were the sufferings he bore, ours the sorrows he carried. But we, we thought of him as someone punished, struck by God and brought low. Yet he was pierced through for our faults, crushed for our sins. On him lies a punishment that brings us peace, and through his wounds we are healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each taking his own way, and the Lord burdened him with the sins of all of us. Harshly dealt with, he bore it humbly. He never opened his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughterhouse, like a sheep that is dumb before its shearers, never opening its mouth. By force and by law he was taken. Would anyone plead his cause? Yes, he was torn away from the land of the living. For our faults struck down in death. They gave him a grave with the wicked, a tomb with the rich, though he had done no wrong and there had been no perjury in his mouth. The Lord has been pleased to crush him with suffering. If he offers his life in atonement, he shall see his heirs, he shall have a long life, and through him what the Lord wishes will be done. His soul's anguish over, he shall see the light and be content. By his sufferings shall my servant justify many, taking their faults on himself. Hence, I will grant whole hordes for his tribute. He shall divide the spoil with the mighty for surrendering himself to death and letting himself be taken for a sinner while he was bearing the faults of many and praying all the time for sinners. The word of the Lord. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice set me free. Into your hands I commend my spirit. It is you who will redeem me, Lord. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In the face of all my foes I am a reproach, an object of scorn to my neighbours, and of fear to my friends. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. 
Those who see me in the street run far away from me. I am like a dead man, forgotten in men's hearts, like a thing thrown away. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. But as for me, I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My life is in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of all those who hate me. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your love. Be strong. Let your heart take courage, all who hope in the Lord. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Since in Jesus, the Son of God, we have the supreme high priest who has gone through to the highest heavens, we must never let go of the faith that we have professed. For it is not as if we had a high priest who was incapable of feeling our weaknesses with us. But we have one who has been tempted in every way that we are, though he is without sin. Let us be confident then in approaching the throne of grace that we shall have mercy from him and find grace when we are in need of help. During his life on earth, he offered up prayer and entreaty aloud and in silent tears to the one who had the power to save him out of death. And he submitted so humbly that his prayer was heard. Although he was son, he learnt to obey suffering, but having been made perfect, he became for all who obey him the source of eternal salvation. The word of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. Christ was humbly yet, even to accepting death, death on a cross. But God raised him high and gave him the name which is above all names. Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kedron Valley. There was a garden there, and he went into it with his disciples. Judas the traitor knew the place well, since Jesus had often met his disciples there. And he brought the cohort to this place, together with a detachment of guards sent by the chief priests and the Pharisees, all with lanterns and torches and weapons. Knowing everything that was going to happen to him, Jesus then came forward and said, Who are you looking for? They answered, Jesus the Nazarene. He said, I am he. Now Judas the traitor was standing among them. When Jesus said, I am he, they moved back and fell to the ground. He asked them a second time, Who are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus replied, I have told you that I am he. If I am the one you are looking for, let these others go. This was to fulfill the words he had spoken, Not one of those you gave me have I lost. Simon Peter, who carried a sword, drew it and wounded the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its scabbard. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? The cohort and its captain and the Jewish guards seized Jesus and bound him. They took him first to Annas, 
because Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had suggested to the Jews, it is better for one man to die for the people. Simon Peter, with another disciple, followed Jesus. This disciple, who was known to the high priest, went with Jesus into the high priest's palace. But Peter stayed outside the door. So the other disciple, the one known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who was keeping the door, and brought Peter in. The maid on duty at the door said to Peter, Aren't you another of that man's disciples? He answered, I am not. Now it was cold, and the servants and guards had lit a charcoal fire and were standing there warming themselves. So Peter stood there too, warming himself with the others. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly for all the world to hear. I've always taught in the synagogue and in the temple where all the Jews meet together. I have said nothing in secret. But why ask me? Ask my hearers what I taught. They know what I said. At these words, one of the guards standing by gave Jesus a slap in the face, saying, Is that the way to answer the high priest? Jesus replied, If there is something wrong in what I said, point it out. But if there is no offence in it, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him still bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. As Simon Peter stood there warming himself, someone said to him, Aren't you another of his disciples? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relation of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at once a cock crew. They then led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was now morning. They did not go into the praetorium themselves, or they would be defiled and unable to eat the Passover. So Pilate came outside to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They replied, If he were not a criminal, we should not be handing him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and try him by your own law. The Jews answered, We are not allowed to put a man to death. This was to fulfill the words Jesus had spoken, indicating the way he was going to die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and called Jesus to him and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, Do you ask this of your own accord, or have others spoken to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? It is your own people and the chief priests who have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, Mine is not a kingdom of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my men would have fought to prevent me being surrendered to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this kind. Pilate said, So, You are a king then. Jesus answered, It is you who say it. Yes, I am a king. I was born for this. I came into the world for this, to bear witness to the truth. And all who are on the side of truth listen to my voice. Pilate said, Truth? What is that? And with that, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no case against him, but according to a custom of yours, I should release one prisoner at the Passover. Would you like me then to release the king of the Jews? 
At this, they shouted, not this man, but Barabbas. Barabbas was a brigand. Pilate then had Jesus taken away and scourged, and after this, the soldiers twisted some thorns into a crown and put it on his head and dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they slapped him in the face. Pilate came outside again and said to them, Look, I'm going to bring him out to you to let you see that I find no case. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said, Here is the man. When they saw him, the chief priests and the guards shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I can find no case against him. The Jews replied, We have a law, and according to the law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard them say this, his fears increased. Re-entering the praetorium, he said to Jesus, Where do you come from? But, Pilate made, but Jesus made no answer. Pilate then said to him, Are you refusing to speak to me? Surely you know I have power to release you, and I have power to crucify you. Jesus replied, You would have no power over me if it had not been given you from above. That is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater guilt. From that moment, Pilate was anxious to set him free. But the Jews shouted, If you set him free, you are no friend of Caesar's. Anyone who makes himself king is defying Caesar. Hearing these words, Pilate had Jesus brought out and seated himself on the chair of judgment at a place called the pavement in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was Passover preparation day, about the sixth hour. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They said, Take him away. Take him away. Crucify him. Pilate said, Do you want me to crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king except Caesar. So, in the end, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. They then took charge of Jesus, and carrying his own cross, he went out of the city to the place of the skull, or as it is called in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him with two others, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate wrote out a notice and had it fixed to the cross. It ran, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. The, this notice was read by many of the Jews because the place where Jesus was crucified was not far from the city, and the writing was in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the Jewish chief priest said to Pilate, You should not write King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had finished crucifying Jesus, they took his clothing and divided it into four shares, one for each soldier. His undergarment was seamless, woven in one piece from neck to hem, so they said to one another, Instead of tearing it, let's throw dice to decide who is to have it. In this way, the words of Scripture were fulfilled. They shared out my clothing among them. They cast lots for my clothes. This is exactly what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary of Magdala. 
Seeing his mother and the disciple he loved standing near her, Jesus said to his mother, Woman, this is your son. Then to the disciple he said, This is your mother. And from that moment, the disciple made a place for her in his home. After this, Jesus knew that everything had now been completed And to fulfill the scripture perfectly, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of vinegar stood there. So putting a sponge soaked in vinegar on a hyssop stick, they held it up to his mouth. After Jesus had taken the vinegar, he said, It is accomplished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. It was preparation day, and to prevent the bodies remaining on the cross during the Sabbath, since that Sabbath was a day of special solemnity, the Jews asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken away. Consequently, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man who'd been crucified with him, and then of the other. When they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead. And so, instead of breaking his legs, one of the soldiers pierced his side of a lance, and immediately there came out blood and water. This is the evidence of one who saw it, trustworthy evidence, and he knows he speaks the truth, and he gives it so that you may believe as well, because all this happened to fulfill the words of Scripture, not one bone of his will be broken. And again, in another place, Scripture says, they will look on the one whom they've pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, because he was afraid of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him remove the body of Jesus. Pilate gave permission, so they came and took it away. Nicodemus came as well, the same one who had first come to Jesus at night time, and he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices in linen cloths, following the Jewish burial custom. At the place where he'd been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. Since it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was near at hand, they laid Jesus there. Two thoughts, and I don't know if you're there, that's the funny thing again, because it all went a bit wobbly before we went live streaming, so I'm hoping that it is live streaming and you're hearing me, and if you're not, well, then I'm going to say what I'm going to say anyway in this church, because you're all here with me in spirit, and that's one of the most beautiful things about this uncertain time that we are in at present. I'm going to nick an idea. You know, I'm good at that. And I'm nicking it from that theologian who I started Lent with, if you remember, Hans von Balthasar, a great favourite of Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict. And he speaks of the crucifixion in a beautiful way. And he picks out various points of the crucifixion and the words of Jesus to remind us that this, of course, is the birth of the church. And he picks out the words that Jesus speaks to his mother, woman, this is your son, and to John the beloved, this is your mother. And with those words and the fact that they then take care of each other, 
the Lord is instigating the church. A church made up of men and women, a church which at its heart, at its purpose, why we are here is because its central theme is love, taking care of each other. Mary taking care of John, John taking care of Mary. This little church of love. The church is established through that love, that taking care that Mary and John show each other from the crucifixion, from Jesus' command. And then it is accomplished. Other Gospels, we have the Lord saying, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Ah, with those words, it is accomplished, those final words of Jesus, into your hands I commend my spirit. The spirit just leaves Jesus and, like one of those, one of those bath fizz balls that you throw into the bath and it fizzes everywhere, the spirit just completely surrounds creation, the past, the present, the future, and allows God's forgiveness to spill through all decades and generations in the past, the present, and the future. Like one of those wonderful bar fizzballs made up of that sodium bicarbonate that kind of sends it spinning in the water. The Holy Spirit fizzes into action with that great gift of God's forgiveness coming from the crucifixion. Peter isn't there. Peter has betrayed the Lord, he's elsewhere. And Jesus, after the resurrection, as we know, goes out to find Peter and asks him, as we well know when he's found, do you love me? And of course, Peter is the first pope. He represents the church being looked after by representatives of Christ. Whoever they are in whatever shape or form they are, bishops, cardinals, priests, deacons, lay people, whatever, religious, all sent to take care of the church. And again, it is this command of love. Do you love me? He asks Peter. Of course you know I love you. So with that confirmation of Peter's love, that confirmation of discipleship, of those being called to serve others, serve the little church of love. The church is perfectly formed from the crucifixion and the resurrection. Quite beautiful, quite wonderful. That kind of awareness, that good news, it would, in my second thought, have been very much discovered and thought about and prayed through and wondered and believed in people's homes. That time when the church was so small and it was being persecuted, people would gather together to discuss this good news. And within the discussion of that good news, they would get this tremendous power to go out and spread the good news later on. And if there's anything that's going to come forth from this very odd time of this pandemic, it is the God who speaks. This year of the word, we've got time while being at home to look at the scriptures and to let them infuse us and to give us that enthusiasm and that willpower after this lockdown to go out and spread the good news that we have discovered. We're going to continue now with those solemn intercessions of the church. And as I put into my email... Pope Francis, there is an extra intercession which we're asked to pray. Again, it is about the coronavirus and its impact upon the world. These are beautiful intercessions. They encompass the mission and purpose of the church. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that, leading our life in tranquility and quiet, 
we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your, mercy, of your mercy, that your church, spread throughout all the world, may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our most holy father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favour on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our Bishop Vincent, for all bishops, priests and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayers for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, Increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth, to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty, ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty, ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made perfect witnesses to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty, ever-living God, who created all people, to seek you always by desiring you, 
and by finding you come to rest, grant we pray that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of people, look with favour, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace and freedom of religion may, through your gift, be made made secure, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray dearly, beloved, to God the Almighty Father, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travellers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, May the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand through Christ our Lord. And we say together, let us pray also for all those who suffer the consequences of the current pandemic, that God the Father may grant health to the sick, strength to those who care for them, comfort to families, and salvation to all the victims who have died. Almighty, ever-living God, only support of our human weakness, look with compassion upon the sorrowful condition of your children who suffer because of this pandemic. Relieve the pain of the sick, give strength to those who care for them, Welcome into your peace those who have died, and throughout this time of tribulation, grant that we all may find comfort in your merciful love, through Christ our Lord. Amen. This is the wood of the cross on which our Saviour hung. Come, come, let us adore. Come, come, let us adore the Saviour of the world. This is the wood of the cross on which our Saviour hung. Come, come, let us adore. Come, come, let us adore the Saviour of the world. This is the wood of the cross on which our Saviour hung. Come, come, let us adore. Come, come, let us adore the Saviour of the world. Come, come, let us adore. Come, come, let us adore the Saviour of the world.
at the Saviour's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Let us pray. Ever-living God, you have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Son. Preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. So we gather together again around about eight o'clock for just a half an hour meditation, time of prayer around the cross. And then tomorrow evening we begin our Easter vigil, once again being live streamed at 8 p.m.